Hello and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come together and talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we meet a distinguished guest and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran collecting mailbox money, or a frustrated genius scratching out verses on the back of company letterhead, or anywhere in between, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, before we get started today, I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to write me after our inaugural episode with comments, compliments, critiques, questions, all that. Um, And I want to address the most common critique I received, which is that the show did not feature any of uh, the guests' actual songs. And I agree with you. The show would be much better with them, and in fact... In the original pilot I recorded, I had several of Joe Ely's songs sprinkled throughout, and it was, on balance, a much better episode. Here's the catch. To my understanding, as of yet, there is no way to comprehensively license the use of copyrighted music in a podcast. I wish that I could just go to BMI or ASCAP, one of the performing rights organizations, and purchase some sort of annual blanket license for the songs of all the artists that I'll host here, but to my knowledge, that does not exist yet for this medium, at least. Uh, Now, I guess a workaround to that would be uh, to have the artists come in and and play a live version of one of their songs here. Um, But as for myself, and uh, having done that before, I can tell you that playing songs live in an interview setting is extraordinarily unsatisfying and uh, uninspiring. It has all the feeling of being driven to the movie theater by your girlfriend's parents. So I'm already imposing on these folks for an hour or two of their time, and I want it to be as painless and effortless as possible, so we're going to get rid of that workaround. So that's why you won't be hearing any of these songwriters' compositions on the show. Uh, I will be publishing Spotify playlists of what I consider to be our guests' most essential songs to act as a companion piece. Um, So if you're interested in finding a good starting point for some of these songwriters that you're unfamiliar with, go follow me on Spotify, and you can start there. Um, And if you know copyright law better than I do, and you can offer some insight on this or anything else uh, with the podcast, you can always get a hold of me um, at theworkingsongwriter at gmail.com. Finally, before we get started, if you'd like to hear some of my songs, I'll be appearing live March 19th in Waco, Texas at Common Grounds, March 25th in Austin, Texas with Todd Snyder at Hogg Auditorium, March 28th and 29th in Chicago with Langhorn Slim at City Winery, and April 9th in Houston, Texas at the Mucky Duck, and plenty more places after that. Just go check the web. Okay. That's all the announcements I have for you. I really hope you enjoy this month's episode. Go and ask your favorite songwriter who they believe is setting the bar these days, and I'll bet you'll hear the name James McMurtry often. Born in 1962 and raised in Leesburg, Virginia, The Journeyman is now 25 years, nine studio albums, and two live records into a celebrated career. He's the son of Larry McMurtry, the Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist, best known for the film adaptations of his work, including The Last Picture Show, Terms of Endearment, and of course, Lonesome Dove. But James didn't get bit by the literary bug, once remarking of his own reading habits, quote, I might read one book a year, and sometimes I skip a year. 
His first album, Too Long in the Wasteland, was produced by John Mellencamp, who said of him, James writes like he's lived a lifetime. Over the years, McMurtry has released albums with Columbia, Sugar Hill, Compadre, and Lightning Rod Records. The novelist Stephen King called him the fiercest songwriter of his generation. The BBC's Bob Harris called him the most vital lyricist working in America today. In 2006, his record Childish Things was named Album of the Year by the Americana Music Association. James is especially beloved in his city of residence, Austin, Texas. That's his green-brimmed image right smack in the middle of the giant mural on South Austin Music's sidewall. The intense hometown affection is likely the result of his work ethic and his no-bullshit demeanor on stage and off stage. If he's not on the road, you can find him playing the Continental Club every Wednesday night at midnight. Last year, he said to Rolling Stone magazine, We're basically the service industry. We're symbiotically tied to the club business, beer sales and tips. I've seen a lot of young bands that think they're artists and they're not here to sell beer. James and I got together at the South Austin home of his manager and my friend, Jenny Finlay. Well, I think we're kind of working without a safety net here because Jenny said if we ran out of things to talk about, I should talk to you about fishing. Hmm. But I don't know fucking anything about fishing. Well, I don't don't remember much about it. (laughs) I did, um, I was telling you I grew up in Greenbelt. I did crab a little bit when yeah. I was a kid on the Chesapeake Bay. Did you ever do any yeah. of that or just Yeah, fish? I got down there a little bit. I had a, a friend of mine had a he had a house down near uh, Coles Point, somewhere down there on the Virginia side. Mm-hmm. And that's actually, that's where I got the, the story for Carlisle's Hall on this last record. Was, uh, we were just down there messing around and somebody was running an off-season seine and mm-hmm. we heard about it and went up there and helped him drag in that net. Which is pretty. You know, it's pretty interesting. They had these, these big high gunnel punt boats, and you just that were all they were for was to hold the net. And mm-hmm. we'd stand in there and pull that net in hand over hand, and then we'd get to keep the croaker and the little fish that were gilled in it. Yeah. And then there was a rope, a cable at the other end that was fed through a motor they called a donkey motor. Mm-hmm. And the guy that ran it was the donkey man, <laughs> as I guess they used to pull the sands in with donkeys. I don't know, but. Uh, yeah, he'd pull, and we'd pull the other end, and finally it would get down to where there's just a big circle full of blue fish and rock and oh, yeah. bigger fish. And what? then take it to the shore to steam immediately, or what? No, that was, that was for market. They were oh, okay. And that, and that was illegal. It was it was off. Yeah, I think commercial season was was closed at that point of the year. But, oh well. But, well, I mean, you can actually get. This might be a controversial thing to say publicly, but I think you can probably get better. Uh, blue crab from the gulf now than you can from chesapeake because it's been so overfished and overcrabbed like that yeah i noticed the crabs are smaller now um when you were growing up in leesburg and you left i'm kind of interested the hardcore scene in dc was just starting to bubble up right around then were you aware of that at all i was aware you? of it i wasn't really a fan uh, most of my friends were big you know hardcore punk fans and new wave fans and yeah it wasn't really my thing. I, I did get to see some of it, though, when, when the old 930 Club was really happening. Who did you see? Do you remember? I do not remember, except that they were mostly junkies and yeah, you know, really atrophied limbs and <laughs> bad-looking people. Yeah, because I guess Bad Brains would have just been getting started then. Minor Threat would have been just getting started then as well. Did you ever, um, did you ever buy an instrument over at Chuck Levin's in Silver Spring? No, I bought it Melody Music in Leesburg. Okay. I still have a guitar from there. What guitar is it? It's an old D25 Guild. Yeah. Yeah. I own uh Every time I see a D25 Guild come up on eBay for 600 bucks or less, I just buy it. Yeah, you got if, to. If it's earlier If than, it's got the wide headstock and you know, the George Grun era 70s, you know, that's that's yeah. real good Honduran mahogany that you just can't get anymore. It's really good. Yeah. It's really good. Even though I mean to my understanding like 75% of the guitar is plywood, I think. Yeah, oh yeah, the the, the press, but the arch back is a plywood guitar, but it, it's stronger than a brace guitar, and I think yeah. it's just as resonant. Um, I've got several, I've got a couple of GF30s from the 80s, which are, you know, just bulletproof, and the, the necks are laminated, so you can throw them in any kind of whack yeah. tuning you want, and it doesn't go out of tune. 
and I, and it was really good if you can hang a big old sunrise pickup or some kind of magnet in the hole. Do you use a sunrise? For yeah, you? with it with the GF30, I do. The trick to that is you have to have a nickel wind nickel winding on the string. Oh, okay. magnet, so like a magnet can't hear bronze. Okay, bronze is magnetically invisible. But the GHS makes a string called white bronze, which actually has no bronze content in it. It just it's a nickel iron alloy. And the, the magnet. It's highly magnetic, so you get a real good rich sound out of it. Do you have? Don't the Sunrise you have to use um, like their proprietary? Uh, it's best if you use their preamp. I mean, you can use what you want. Um, and, and you know, a lot of times the battery will go out in that preamp, and I'll just go straight in. Mm-hmm. But I generally use an amp. To, I split the signal. I send one to the direct, and I send another back to my amp. So it's kind of a hybrid sound by the time it's all said and done. For the solo show, too? Yeah. Well, solo shows I've taken to just go and direct. Yeah. But uh, I used to carry an amp around on those solo things. I just got tired of lifting it. <laughs> <laughs> Who can blame you? You ever end up down in Ocean City or any of those uh, vacation spots in Maryland? I've, I've driven past it. Not all those eastern shore, you know. Just south of Delaware. There's one time we had to go from somewhere in middle Pennsylvania to... Uh, Virginia Beach, and so we hopped the bridge out there and went down mm-hmm. the eastern shore and across the the bridge tunnel. Yeah, only time I ever did that. It's a nice country. There's all those old. Uh, there's still tobacco being grown out there and stuff. Yeah. It's really nice. A lot of soybeans though. A lot of soybeans too. Soybeans and peanuts. I guess it pays a little bit more. Yeah. You've said before that some of your earliest influences uh, were. Christofferson and John Prine. When did you first hear that self-titled John Prine album, and who gave it to you? I think uh, my roommate in boarding school turned me on to John Prine. I'd never heard of him, mm-hmm. uh, but I did. I saw Christofferson when I was nine. Uh, the, the second concert I went to, uh, my mother and stepdad took me to to see Chris at uh, a place called the Mosque in Richmond, uh-huh. and uh, Stephen Bruton was in the band. Really. Yeah, and, I, and he eventually, you know, I played with him some when I got to Austin. He was actually, he, he came out on the road with me for about two weeks on my first tour. Did he really? Yeah, but there, there's a connection with him because on that same tour that I saw Chris in, in Richmond, my dad had a rare bookstore in D.C., in Georgetown, right down the street from the cellar door, mm-hmm. which was the gig in, in Georgetown in those days. It was before Child Herald and the whole punk scene came mm-hmm. up. And... Uh, of course, Stephen was in the band, and my, my dad had just opened this store, and uh, Stephen came in, and he bought a $50 book. And they had, you know, that was the first $50 book they ever sold. <laughs> <laughs> and that was probably about what the rent cost in those days. In D.C.? On, on that little bitty tiny shop that they had, the original booked up. Uh, was right, it's 31st and M Street. Um, I think the rent was So years later, I asked now. Stephen, what'd you buy? He says, well, I... I said, I bought Diary of a Drug Fiend. I was 22, and I had a hat band full of brown mescaline. I wanted to know what it was all about. <laughs> um, around that time, did you ever get into, because I hear some of it in your stuff, and it would be along the lines of Prine and Winchet and uh, Christopherson. Did you ever listen to that Jesse Winchester album, that first one with his face? Uh, I was not aware of Jesse Winchester until I moved to San Antonio. And he would come through every now and then and play uh, mm-hmm. Leon Springs Cafe. Uh, I guess I, I knew his songs from Amy Lou Harris. Mm-hmm. She had, she covered Songbird or something like that. Mm-hmm. And he'd come down and gig to San Antonio? He, yeah, there was a place out in Leon Springs, or really one of my first gigs. Um, and that's that's where you know the, the folk crowd came through Yeah, pretty much. You know, and I actually ran sound for Ramblin' Jack Elliott one time. Really? God knows what I made him sound like. <laughs> <laughs> I was never a very good sound man. Just turn it up. Yeah. So you first started kicking around playing when you were going to school. It was in, in Tucson. In Tucson, yeah. yeah. Um, at that time, I guess your life can go any number of directions. If you hadn't ended up writing songs, what were some other options on the table for you to, to do going forward? Uh, I thought about going to trucker school or maybe going in the Army. You know, I, I didn't really have a direction. Uh, but you know, I got these beer garden gigs, and I, I got good enough at them. Yeah. You know, they, they weren't running me off the stage or anything. Yeah. Uh, 
And I didn't realize how badly I sang until years later after I had a record deal, you know. <laughs> like, I only just now learned to sing. Fair enough. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess going to trucker school and becoming a trucker is ultimately not that different of what it's like to be a musician in the 21st century. Yeah, the tonnage is a little different, well, though, you know, that's, and that's what scared me. I did not, you know, <laughs> I would have loved to have been a trucker, except uh, I'm scared to death of trucks. Yeah, <laughs> there's that. There's that. So you hit those cafes and, and stuff in San Antonio for a while, and you get a bit of a break um, from playing the Kerrville Folk Festival. Um uh, how did you fall into that? Um, I just found out about it, and I guess one time I, I heard that Guy Clark was was uh, hosting one of those ballad tree sessions where you stand under the tree and you play your songs, and so I raced out there, barely got there in oh. time, just kind of ran up. I wasn't even in line at the beginning, and uh -huh. the guy said, oh, go ahead and play, you're here. You know, and he was congratulatory and you know, very supportive, and... Uh, so I guess it was the next year I entered the New Folk Contest. And I, I, they had like six winners. They, they say there were no places, but you know, the, the guy that gets invited back to play the main stage the next year, you can that's, put two the, that's the winner. And you know, that was Buddy Mondlock that year. But, mm -hmm. uh, but there was a bunch of us in that, that class. There was, there was Buddy and me and two nice girls. And uh, uh, what was that guy? Pierce Pettis was among those. I can't mm -hmm. remember who else was in there. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what song you played for the... I played uh, what eventually became Talking at the Texaco. Back then it didn't have a bridge in it. Mm -hmm. And it was not... I think it was just called Small Town. And, and then when I recorded it with John Mellencamp, he decided it might be a good idea for you to change the title on this song. Yeah. But there was that, and there was Crazy Wind was the other one. Those are really the only two songs I had. And I had to... When I came back for that winner's concert, I had to play like three or four you know a half hour's worth of music and so i had to write terry <laughs> i had yeah. to finish terry for that and a couple more i can't remember there's nothing quite as frightening at the start of your career when uh you get booked for like let's say like an hour an hour and a half set and you're like i have 15 minutes worth of material yeah who has that kind of material? <laughs> four to five minutes <laughs> who has that kind of material mm -hmm. you hear about um I think it'd be even more brutal though to be a comic because comics you hear about how long it takes them to Ooh. build up material and then they burn it and they can't do it anymore. Really quick, yeah. You know. And you're, yeah, they're just up there naked. They don't have a guitar to hide behind or anything. Yeah. Well, and you can you can go up on stage at the Birchmere tomorrow and play Level Land, and people would love it. But no one wants to hear, uh, you know, no one wants to hear Louis C.K. do his airplane joke tomorrow. Again, you no. know. Um, so you get back from Kerrville. It allows you to play a little bit in Austin and. You've mentioned before that uh, part of you is considering heading up to Nashville and going um, the writer's room route. What what sets you away from that fork? Uh, well, I just wrapped off Lonesome Dove. I've been, been working on, on Lonesome, the Lonesome Dove miniseries as a nondescript cowboy. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I was going to go to Nashville, try to try to be a staff writer, because I knew people that did that. I knew it was possible. Mm -hmm. And I went out to Kerrville. I'd been dating a lady out there off and on. We were hanging out in some Mexican restaurant, and Kinky Friedman was there. There you go. And I'd met him back in the cellar door days. He, he was a friend of Maureen Orth, who wrote for Newsweek back then. She actually she wrote the Springsteen cover story, the week that Springsteen was on both uh, Newsweek and Time. Wow. So she did the one for Newsweek. And, and we had, one time we'd traveled to Central Texas with her, and we'd wound up on Kinky's Ranch for a little while. So I kind of knew Kinky. I went and reintroduced myself. And, and he said, oh, why don't you come out the place? You know, So I go out there, and he's living in this Airstream trailer on his, in his parents' summer camp out by, between Kerrville and Bandera. Or Ker I, no, I guess they were on the, in the Medina Highway. He used to have his own place over on the Bandera Highway, but yeah, this was over towards Medina, and, and he's sitting in an airstream talking on the phone, you know, and like acting himself. He acts the character that he that he wrote in the his detective novels. You know, the phone rings, he picks it up, start talking. That's what he says, and he's smoking a cigar, and he says, "You, know, you can tune a guitar, can't you?" And he, he just got off a plane, so I, I twisted up the guitar and I started playing a little bit. He said, "Well, you can play too. Why don't you come come to D.C. with me? I, I got three gigs." You know, I got going to D.C. and New York and Boston. And, you know, 
can't pay you, but if you've got something, you've got nothing better to do, why don't you come up there? And, well, I'd, I had nothing better to do. <laughs> you know, absolutely. And I had a little bit of money in my pocket from, from Lonesome Dove. So. so I went up there, and my dad still had the bookstore in D.C. at the time. He since closed it, uh, moved the whole operation to North Texas where he could afford the real, real estate. But, but back then, it, it was still going great guns. And he had two apartments over the shop, which he used for storage mostly. And I happened to be staying in the one that had the the answering machine. Mm -hmm. Back then you had an actual physical machine that you had you hit play. There was cassettes in it. There Cassette was a, a loop and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And, and Larry made his living as a screenwriter mostly. He didn't, you know, it was before Lonesome Dove. Well, no, no this is after Lonesome Dove. Right. But until Lonesome Dove, his main gig was screenwriting because his books just didn't sell that well. Mm -hmm. That one was a bestseller, but before then he was lucky to sell five thousand hard copy. Right. So, but he got into screenwriting in the early seventies because you know Bogdanovich let him do co-write that script for a picture show, mm -hmm. and he had been hired. Mellencamp hired him to write us write the screenplay for his movie, mm -hmm. and I had a little like six song demo cassette that I had done that I was going to pitch around Nashville and. And they were supposed to get together and rewrite that script. So I gave a tape to Larry and said, you know, could you give that to Mr. Mellencamp and see if he wants to cut one of these songs. That way, when I get to Nashville, somebody will rent me an apartment. Right. Because I already have a cut. And uh, I wasn't even looking for my own record deal. I didn't, I didn't know people that did that. So it, it wasn't so really that wasn't quite even an possible. It wasn't, I, didn't, I didn't see it, it as possible for me. Um, but I, I happened to be in the D.C. apartment when Mellencamp called and left a message. He uh, said, Larry, you gotta, you got to be kidding about this fucking kid of yours. Send him out here to Indiana. I want to talk to him. <laughs> so I called him up the next day. So I said, Mr. Mellencamp? He said, you can knock that shit off right now. Really? <laughs> really? Yeah. Call him John. And, and so it was then his idea. He said, I, hey, I don't want to cut this. I yeah, want you, you well, to well, cut this. Produce your, he was looking for somebody to produce, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he, he, he kind of had an obsession with some of Larry's work. So maybe that figured in. Um, but um, so, but he, he, yeah, he called up and said, well, have you got enough songs for a record? I said, no. He said, well, can you write them by February? I said, sure. Because mm -hmm. I, I wasn't going to let it go. I knew I wasn't really ready. But yeah, I didn't expect the door to open again. You know, somebody you know, he might have a wild idea to produce this McMurtry kid, but if you wait six months, he you got to strike might get interested side. in something else. So, yeah. yeah. So that would become too long in the wasteland, and it was primarily like his his band and his road band on that album. Not yeah. entirely. Um, there was originally there was another drummer we brought in from Boston. And he wound up on a couple of cuts there. Uh, they fired him. He just didn't gel with the rest of the band. And then Aronoff? Did. And they brought in Aronoff. But they are. They had Grissom, who was not yet in the Mellencamp band. Grissom was still in... With the, Joe? In, he was still with Joe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Joe Ely. And I brought in Dave Pomeroy from Nashville to, to play bass. Oh, you brought him in? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I knew him through Fred Kohler. From okay. All of, you know, I used to go up there and try to write with Fred and... And, gotcha. you know, Dave played with him a lot. What was, looking back on it, what was Mellencamp's vibe as a producer? What were his methods like? Um, seat of the pants. He, he's a really instinctive producer. Uh, pretty tough. He's sort of the Vince Lombardi of, of, of record production, you know. <laughs> Winning is, is the only thing. Yeah. Um, he, as far as he, like song choice or no he, I mean see that's the thing he was very respectful of, of the artist you know he didn't he would question your motives if you changed something and say why did you change the melody of that and you'd have, you'd have to give him a good reason uh, sometimes you might change it back but he was he respected the songs and the writer he was, he was really hard on the band you know a couple times he blew it pretty irascible you know but um uh, but I would uh, I didn't sense any disrespect from him ever. So pretty tough on the band in the sense that it's being mainly cut live and he just felt like they yeah, weren't getting it together. If something wasn't working, you know Yeah, he could get pissed off. But but he got good results and I learned a lot from him 
that, that I applied later when I started producing my own stuff. Because, um, you know, when I started producing, um, I guess I really started when I, I was working with Lloyd Maines on a couple of records. and mm -hmm. But Lloyd would give you a very free hand. And, if you know, there were a couple of times I came in and remixed stuff on my own. Mm -hmm. Just me and the engineer. Without or, or I would add parts, and Lloyd would call in and say, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I'm messing with your art. <laughs> and he said, well, I was painting with a broad brush. Have at it. And there were a couple things, because we were still cutting analog back then. We were doing two-inch down at Cedar Creek. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have Pro Tools. We couldn't straighten out beats or anything. If, if there was a little dip in the groove, it would be annoying. There were, but I, I learned Or it would be for a reason. <laughs> Well, but, you know, but we we always picked the take that had the most life, even if it wasn't the most even take. Uh, and so I remember a couple of times there were little groove problems, and I knew how to fix them because John taught me because you, know, you, you use percussion for that, some kind of percussion, either hand drums or claves. Claves are great. I mean, you go ding, 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 right in the dip in the track, and it's like, hey, look over here. And, oh, and then you, you don't notice that there's just a slight... That's great. Wave in the rhythm track. Did you pick up any other tricks like that from him? That was the main thing I got from him. He, he's really a genius with uh, with percussion. You know, he'll listen to a track and figure out, you know, how to perk it up. Yeah. So you're in Austin in the early 90s, and at that point, um, grunge music has kind of taken the mantle from, like, hair metal in the 80s or whatever, what was most dominant you're on Columbia at that point. Are you ever getting any pushes from A and R people at Columbia to take your stuff in that direction? No, nobody would have believed it coming from me. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly, I mean, Columbia didn't really want me. They got like you know, John. I guess Matola owed him a favor, so he kind of forced me on these poor mid-level guys at Columbia. And a lot of them, they did the best they could, but they didn't know what to make of me. Sure, they didn't. You know, there was no Americana genre at that time. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, they they had a tough job, um, and I and, and surprisingly, I got three records out of them. I don't know how that happened. Yeah. Maybe just Einer took pity on me or something. I don't know. You know, it, it made it kind of made them look good because it was cr critically well received, but right, uh, you know, commercial disaster. But it could be a you know sometimes labels will use that as a prestige. As a prestige button. They to... kind of did then. And also, you know, my royalty rate was a lot less favorable, a lot less <laughs> artist friendly than Springsteen's, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. ago, the Economic Policy Institute, a left-leaning think tank granted, issued a report that at the start of the new millennium, the United States lost over three million jobs to China, three quarters of which were in manufacturing. Last year, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that only about 11% of the American workforce was unionized roughly half of what it was 30 years ago in the earliest years of available comparable statistics. And, according to the Census Bureau, median household income in the U.S., after adjusting for inflation, is roughly the same as it was in 1989. Today, even a remotely informed citizen, upon hearing those statistics I just recited, could likely have finished each one as if it were some perverted call and response. We're so used to hearing them. Because those trends are now so painfully obvious, and they're finding a voice in the wildly popular presidential candidacy of a toxic, jack-o'-lantern-headed, flim-flam man. There's no other word for it. It's a shame such a movement did not more constructively find its voice a decade ago in James McMurtry's protest anthem, We Can't Make It Here Anymore. 
In what is now his calling card song, McMurtry painted a portrait of an increasingly stratified America, racked with such a pathology of consumption that it had begun to consume its own people. It still chokes me up to hear the cynical couplet. Let them eat jelly beans, let them eat cake, let them eat shit, whatever it takes. They can join the Air Force or join the Corps if they can't make it here anymore. Robert Christgau, the self-proclaimed Dean of American Rock Critics, named that song as the single best song of the 2000s in Rolling Stone. A decade later, I don't know if it says more about America or James's artistic intuition that its lyrics ring truer than ever. Um, the first time I heard your music, I was living in Chicago, working, and XRT started playing We Can't Make It Here Anymore, and they played it all the time, and I was working construction, I'd hear it going to work in the morning, Lynn Bramer would play it, and I'd hear it uh, coming home from work at night. I think it's fair to describe that song as a protest song, but, you know, I've read, you've gone on to say a lot of people take that as just a protest song against the Bush administration. You would go on to say that it's larger than that, about larger problems that were started, certainly by the Clinton administration, maybe even by Reagan. In your view, what are those problems? that you're protesting? Oh, uh, well, outsourcing for one. Uh, I mean, that, that's the main gist of that song. And that's, that's why it caught on in a lot of places. Cause you know, especially, you know, Rust Belt and Northeast union states, they lost a lot of jobs to outsourcing. And uh, it re I think it really took wing under Clinton, but nobody's going to stop it. No. You know? Except maybe Sanders, but you know, I don't, no one president, no one human being can stop that. Sanders will try. The thing is, it's not. I feel like outsourcing is now. That was the problem in two thousand four, two thousand five. The problem now is automation, and that well, is there's a, that too. That's a genie that's not going back into the bottle. No. Anytime soon. Yeah, I don't know what they're going to do about that. We'll all be on the dole probably. Well, yeah, I don't know them. if we have a political system that can catch up. Yeah, I mean, you were saying that when you were at Tucson, one of the things that you were considering was being a truck driver. That's the largest industry. That's the largest employment for people without a college degree. In 10 years, that's not going to be a job. I yeah. mean, there's going to be, you know, Elon Musk's uh, bots are going to be driving that thing in 10 years. Well, if it's driving it at all, because it's going back to rail. Or that. You know, that somebody's put a lot of research and development dollars into rail I noticed a few years ago, I was driving out 90 out in West Texas, and there were bundles of brand new railroad ties along the tracks. And I've been crisscrossing this country for 30 years. I never saw that before in my life. Really? And then I get out in New Mexico, and here comes a bunch of machines coming the other way. They look like they're something out of Dr. Seuss. They're all going up and down yeah. and sideways and stuff. You know, and there's this thing in front that... It reaches under the tie, under the tracks, and grabs an old tie and flings it off in the desert and grabs a new tie and stuffs it under the rail and rolls over it, and another machine behind sinking the spikes in. They're probably doing 100 miles of track a day, you know, if they start early. It's a gandy dance crew, what they used to call that back when they used to have to do it with, you know, levers and jacks. Mm -hmm. Now it's just all automated, and, you know, they're driving these machines along. Yeah, I mean, putting in, you know, and I've seen them laying new rail stuff like that. So you know, somebody really thinks the rails are going to come back. Um, so yeah, there, there was a little brief window a few years ago when I was kind of flush, and my accountant said, "Well, you ought to invest in something." I said, "Well, Burlington Northern, because mm -hmm. because uh, it's rail, and I know rail's coming back, and also because Burlington they had a big rail fire in, in their yard in in Portland one time, and that I guess in the '30s and they rewrote their charter because all these hobos helped them put the fire out. <laughs> so they rewrote the charter that says the bums shall have a ride. And after that, Burlington didn't throw anybody off the trains. They'd tell them where to ride. They'd say, now, don't ride under that roll of paper because it's going to roll over you. <laughs> Get in the boxcar if you're going to ride. Is that a real thing? Oh, really? yeah. 
Yeah, you don't want to get on a flat car with a big roll of paper on it. Because the things will roll back and forth six feet. Yeah. No, but I mean, it, it's a real thing that yeah, literally they, bombs they, they, help put out a fire? Yeah, they did. A big fire. And and uh, management actually noticed. Uh, now, I don't know if they noticed now because they, they merged with Santa Fe. So that's what I, I, I bought stock in Burlington Northern Santa Fe at one point, And then Warren uh, Buffett immediately bought the company. And merged and folded sign. it in with something else. So there's no longer a tradable yeah. <laughs> BNSF stock anymore. That's interesting to think about. You were saying there was like these giant automated Dr. Seuss-like machines building the rail line. And you think back 100 years ago when Lyndon Johnson was growing up in the hill country, him and his dad were helping build 290. And they were literally building it without even steam-powered machines. They were building it with donkeys. Yeah. Literally donkeys building 290, and then fast forward, and you're driving into New Mexico, and you see machines building machines. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, how much money did they have to spend to invent that machine? Yeah. So somebody's betting heavily Yes. on it. How bad do you not want to have to pay sick late, leave, and piss breaks yeah. to <laughs> invest that much money? Exactly. Um, what are... And this is a big question. I don't expect you to have the answer to this one, but, you know, I was asking what you thought the problems were uh, that you were addressing with we can't make it here anymore. What What are the solutions in your view for that? Are there any that you can see? See, I don't know. I don't know that. Because it's gotten so much more complex, like you're, you're pointing out, you know, I haven't really even been paying attention to technology other than rail stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. I mean... Some of that could actually create jobs, because I've seen there's one there's a place in Wyoming, the world's largest strip mine, or the the country's large the U.S. the biggest coal strip mine in the U.S. is uh, it's between Gillette and I believe Emerson, Wyoming is due south. It runs for about thirty miles, and you don't know what it is. It's not right up on the road, and if you don't know what you're looking at, you're not going to notice it. But if you look off to the east. About every half a mile or maybe a mile or so, there's going to be an elevator, a mm -hmm. tall tower with a 45-degree chute coming down. That's, I guess that's what they load all those rail cars with. Well, that place has, you know, the most amazing rail system I've ever seen in the U.S. It's got two main lines, one south, one north. Loaded mm -hmm. trains going south, empty trains coming north. It's got two sidings off of either side, and it's got signals every quarter mile. Wow. So those trains aren't going to run into each other. <laughs> right. And if, if you've ever ridden an Amtrak train in the east, it's scary. You know, the, 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 the road beds are so uneven. Yeah. They're going 70 miles an hour on 50-mile-an-hour track. I bet you that coal rides nice and smooth. <laughs> but, you know, somebody's got to run all those signals. Somebody's got to man the computers and stuff that, that makes that happen. Sure. Somebody's going to be working. I don't know if it's enough to offset the automation, but... I would personally guess it's not, and hopefully we're going to have a political system that can uh, that can catch up with that. Um, unfortunately, we have a political system that's racing towards a Donald Trump presidency right now. So I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think they want the presidency. What do you if, think? If Republicans had the presidency, they'd actually have to do what they say they want to do, mm -hmm. which is repeal Obamacare. And if they did that, it would cost the insurers that back them billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So they don't really want to do that. Mm -hmm. They want you know, us camo guys to, to think they want to do that. Right. But they need an excuse not to actually do it. So they're going to need a Democrat in the White House because that's the guy with the veto pen. Right. And, you know, they're going to hang on to power because they got the state houses, they got the locals, they got the Supreme Court, they got both houses of Congress. Man. They got to have a Democratic president or they're screwed. They really, I don't even understand how they beat the Democrats to the punch so hard with the state house. Thing. I mean, that's that's a pretty well, fundamental key to the game. Because it shifted over, and it was probably a result of uh, the Voting Rights Act. You know, the In South used to be solidly Democratic. Mm -hmm. uh, now that, you know, what used to be Democrats down there are all Republicans. Sure, the LBJ, we've lost the South for a generation. Well, it's been a couple generations yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. You, um, when that song comes out in 2004, uh, you had a fair amount of, from for people who aren't from Texas or don't live in Texas. There's a strange, there's a strange sort of music fan down here that is kind of like a frat bro 
that mm-hmm. is really into um, like literate singer songwriter stuff. And I think, and I think you had a fair. Robert Earl Keen covered uh, your song "Level Land," and I think you had a fair amount of that in your crowd for a while. Yeah. How did they respond? Were they still in your crowd when you come out with, with that know, song? Some of them still are. I don't know. They, 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 I guess maybe I'm their liberal. I don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of them got really mad. I mean, I, when when I first wrote that song, I, I, I ran down to KGSR. Kevin Connor was still on morning DJ then, and I edited it. I put a bleep in there so he wouldn't get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Old fashioned Johnny Cash style bleep. But um, played that song on the air. And I had pretty mean emails coming into my website before I even got home. Wow. It was morning drive time. Well, you know, that was that was when Bush's numbers were soaring. And everybody took it. And they, they all had their egos wrapped up in that guy. And, uh, a little while later, it turned around, especially in the Northeast. Um, people started to sour on him. And, you know, suddenly Bangor, Maine was my biggest market because Stephen King owns a big classic rock station there, WKIT. Mm-hmm. And he put it on the air, and Maine had lost thirty thousand jobs to outsourcing at that time. Oh wow! So suddenly, <laughs> I'm big in Maine. Do you? So you you'll go up and you'll hit Maine on the tour now? <laughs> yeah, you know I do it. Well, every year I go up to the Blue Hill Fair. And there's another uh, place down in uh, Savage Savage Oaks Winery down by Augusta. Mm-hmm. So. That. It's close enough that the same sound company rents for both gigs. Gotcha. So we can we can actually fly into Portland and yep. do that. Um, my favorite song of yours um, is uh, it, it was a magical radio moment for me. Um, I was driving out of New York City trying to get away from Hurricane Sandy. It was about to hit. Hmm. I was driving over the Triborough Bridge, and it was like a calm before the storm. And I have FUV on the stereo, windows down, because it was very nice uh, right before Sandy rolled in. And uh, some genius, I don't know who it was, some genius put on Hurricane Party. Oh, really? Right then, yeah, in uh, right in the middle of New York City, right before it got hit by a... Um, the FUV put that on. Yeah, right before uh, the hurricane hit. And Ranger Rita. Yeah. Was she still on? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It might have been her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to know, my relationship with that song deepened a lot. You know, you'll have a moment with a song uh, every once in a while that'll take it from you saying, like, yeah, I like this song, it's good, to like, this is my song. And that was a moment for me. And what's really interesting to me about that song, the climactic couplet of that song is, the morning's first cigarette that's as good as it gets, I guess I should know by now, which is pretty much as dark as a sentiment as I think you come up with. And yet, to me... That song, when I listen to it, is is uh, is a celebration of this weird little life that we get. I think it's such a. How do how do you categorize that song in your mind when you when you think about it all these years later? That's one of my favorite to play. I don't know. That uh, just came pretty naturally. Uh, I recently lost my gray striped cat, so I'm kind of, <laughs> kind of sad now. <laughs> Um, but I also yeah, I used to smoke a lot, and it was it did seem like that you know that was the first cigarette you spent the rest of the day chasing that, oh. trying to get that back. Oh. Just kind of eventually, I got where I got bronchitis twice a year, real bad, and had to quit. Oh man, I uh, I used to smoke two packs a day, and I had to quit. And I always I would give it all. I would give up coffee. I would give up booze. I would give up. I don't smoke that much weed, but I give up weed. If I could just smoke a pack a day, I just I miss it so much. But it, particularly if you're going to sing for a living, I mean, it's yeah, well, that's what got me. I got sick right before a tour, and uh, yeah, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to work if I didn't quit. And then by the time I got back off the road, I'd already gotten through most of the craziness. Yeah, and it was just easier to stay off than just it was off. to ever worry about wrestling with that again. Well, at least you you quit in time to not um, have to resort to vaping. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, that that doesn't look right to me. I don't, you're not burning anything, you know. <laughs> that was half the fun of it was playing with fire. After producing the last three of his albums himself, with Stuart Sullivan behind the board engineering and mixing. James decided to take a bit of a left turn with his most recent record, Complicated Game, which was released last year. 
He hired his producer, C.C. Adcock, the Louisiana-based swamp rocker, known for his work with Zydeco outfits like Little Band of Gold and blues musician Doyle Bramhall. McMurtry decamped to New Orleans with his road band to cut the basic tracks. Some of the songs he brought with him, some of them he penned on the fly while killing time at the R-Bar between sessions. I wanted to hear from James the difference in process between his first record with Mellencamp and his latest in Louisiana so many years later. I'd imagine that um, a few things have changed since 1989's Too Long in the Wasteland to a uh, complicated game as far as record making goes. How was it... Can you explain just some of the uh, the hallmark differences between making a record then and making a record now these days? Much, much easier to edit. It's just a matter of grabbing a waveform and moving it to another part of the screen mm-hmm. and crossfading it. Uh, you know, back in, in the old days, we had to you know, take a razor blade and a deep breath <laughs> and line it up with a kick drum hit because yeah. wherever you splice, there's going to be a pop. So there better already be a pop there right. to disguise it. All right, And we used to edit minutes out of songs mm-hmm. that way. Um, but uh, that wasn't really my worry. That was the engineer that had to worry about that. But yeah, that, uh, yeah computers have made the making a record a whole lot different. How about financially? How is it different? Well, we can't afford tape anymore. <laughs> we better have those computers. Yeah. You know, what what does a reel of, of Ampex go for now? Uh, you know, like $200 a reel yeah. or something like that. Yeah, a couple hundred bucks. Two inch. You know, you can't get quantity anymore. You can't get tape, even if you want it. Uh, and then it's just the business has changed whereby, you know, we used to, we used to tour to promote record sales because we expected to make our living off royalties from record sales. Now it's the other way around. We put a record out so that critics will write about us and people will know we're coming to town and they'll fill up the seats in the clubs. And, right. Because, you know, we're, we're taking it all off the road now, which doesn't, you know, that, that's okay with me because I never was making anything off record sales anyway. Right. You know, we learned to tour. Do you feel like now, uh, you were mentioning earlier that you were saying, well, yeah, when grunge was around, I was playing Americana music and there wasn't even Americana music. Then, yeah. Do you think uh, Americana music is just kind of experiencing a, uh, just kind of a brief bump, or do you think it's become a genre that will be able to continue well, on? I don't know. It, it seems to be narrowing. I don't know, you know. It used to kind of be a catch-all for whatever didn't fit into other major formats. Mm-hmm. Um I'm not sure what it is now. I mean, it, it, it's almost like any any genre that it, it doesn't really know what it is. It's just trying to stay alive. Yep. So now they're 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 taking in more of the you know the Bonnie rates and the right you know the, the older bigger names. Um, right. And and I've seen that before because I, I was also around at the inception of Triple A. I had I think I had the first number one Triple A single. What song? Where's Johnny? It, at that time, there were 25 stations reporting to Philip Hard's, the, the Hard Report they, uh-huh. they used to, which was an actual mailed letter. It wasn't an email yet. <laughs> um, was that off Where'd You Hide the Body? That was off of uh, Candyland. Oh. That was 1990, yeah. But that, it was the Hard Report, I believe. And yeah, yeah, Where's Johnny was number one. But, you know, then AAA kind of outgrew itself. It got where it kind of sloughed us back off and then Americana <laughs> came up and right. that's where we are now and maybe Americana goes the way of AAA and something else comes up. There's always something keeps coming up that keeps us from total obscurity. <laughs> yeah, I and and how do you deal with that uh, as an artist trying to make a living? Um, I got enough longevity that I think I can withstand whatever the shifts are because I've just been doing it so long. I wouldn't, you know, my son's trying to figure it out now. He's just starting. He's, you know, 25. And mm-hmm. He's pretty sharp. He, he watches he what's going on. But, but it's tough for the young. It is. I Yeah, your son Curtis, I'm I'm buddies with him. I, I've talked with him about it a bunch, and there's just nothing you can really... 
offer besides, well, she's just going to have to stay in go it. Go at it. Yeah, well, that, that's, you know, that's what they used to say is hang on to your number and don't step out of line. I think Steve Earle said that about Nashville, about, you know. Right. So, yeah, there were guys that should have got a deal before I did, but they stepped out of line. They stepped out of line. Oh, man. You've, uh, speaking of guys that have stayed in the line, uh, you've had a long time band, Darren Hess on drums, Cornbread on bass, Tim Holt playing some guitar and also moving the faders for you. Yeah, well, Tim started out running sound, I think, in 98 or so. And we had, and Ronnie Johnson played bass for us for, for like 16 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, we finally burned him out and <laughs> Cornbread came in. How do you strike the balance between keeping a regular band that works and doing solo stuff and... I basically I do solo stuff when I run out of road when I, when I can't route the band out of Texas to wherever I need to go then I get in a plane and fly out and mm-hmm. rent a car and drive around for a week. And fortunately those guys are pretty good house framers too so they they, they get along they can get along when I'm not on the road but, but it's it's kind of hard you know you, you I want to keep them working as much as I can I'm kind of having a little bit of a lull right now. Mm. But you, you have to keep working to keep your chops up. So, I mean, it's really good that we have that regular Continental Club gig um, yeah. midweek at the Con- in Austin. But I, I'm starting to feel it now. Even like usually we have a lot more weekend work than we've had lately. Mm-hmm. And that that makes everything tighter. And now and we go a whole week between gigs. It's, yeah. It gets a little scary sometimes. Yeah, it's, we can we can fake our way through it, no matter how weird it gets. <laughs> you know, looking at your own work, what would you say your greatest weakness as a songwriter and an artist is? What would you like to do better? Mm, I like to have a broader scope, or I think it would help me to have a broader scope. But I've always been pretty narrow. I've, I've been in the the Christopherson Prime vein for a long time. Those mm-hmm. are, those are great guys, talented writers, but. Mm-hmm. There's other things can be done, and well, that's something Curtis is teaching me. Because he, he's oh, got, yeah. a, you know, he, he's got a uh, got a music comp degree. He's he's studied ethnomusicology. He can mm-hmm. he's got a lot of influences, and you, you hear his songs, and some of them are like show tunes. They really and are. It's really difficult to be on stage with him and try to try to hang with him. Right. Once in a while, we'll do these father son shows, and but you know that's always a good thing. It stretches me a little bit. So you think uh, just musically and uh, maybe also the vernacular that you speak with or your characters I, speak with in the well, songs? Uh, not so much lyric writing, but, you know, I, I don't know key shifts and right. diminished chords and stuff like that. There, there, there are things, you know, I used to think three chords and an attitude was the best approach, but there are some subtleties you can get out of, out of different voicings that are worth having. Yeah, three chords and attitude, though, is a good place to start. I yeah, think. a good start, but, you know, I've been, I'm 53 years old. And <laughs> uh, who is a hero of yours, musical or otherwise? Uh, Johnny Cash was my first real hero, musically, I think. And later, Christopherson, Brian, all those guys. I met a bunch of my heroes. Did you get to meet Cash? And- I didn't get to meet Cash, no. Uh, I met Chris and, and Brian a few times. That's great. How about otherwise, who would be someone outside of the musical realm that's a hero of yours? Outside of the musical realm? Joe Namath, probably. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. He just has such style. Broadway Joe. Um, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Just to wrap up, in your eyes... What is the path that you took in life, and who have you become as a result? In a way, you could say I took the path of least resistance. You think? Yeah, I could not. I mean, I tried to be a student for a while, but I just I was done with it by the time I got to college. I just didn't want to be there anymore. Academia was... That was the small town I grew up in. I, my earliest memories, both my parents were teaching on the college level. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was just done, and I didn't see the point in it. And I liked to play music, and I got to play music. So yeah. I lucked out. It's Well, I think uh, it, it's still a tough job, though. You know, and it, well, but every job's tough. Yeah. You know, 
you better like it. Yeah. James, thanks so much for taking well, your thank time you, Joe. this afternoon. I really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. Thanks. Cheers. That's our show for this month. If you enjoyed it, the best way to support is to write a brief review over in the iTunes store. It just takes a few moments, it's free, and it helps us out a great deal. James's latest album is entitled Complicated Game, available wherever digital music is sold. Thanks to his manager, Jenny Finlay, for making the interview possible, and to Brian T. Atkinson for bringing the good vibes. This episode was engineered by Matt Schusler. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, remember, an expensive microphone is not a song, a record deal is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song. <laughs>